Uh, let me just hit this. So, you know, symptomatic. So really what we're gonna talk about um, is symptomatic Chiari's. I mean, if patients don't have any symptoms whatsoever and they're incidentally found to have a Chiari, which happens, I see them, you know, once a month in my office, somebody who got an MRI for something else and they have an incidental Chiari. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about patients that do have some symptoms, uh, either minor or severe, and also have a Chiari and what that decision uh, uh, tree process is. So Chiari symptoms, um, you know, there's the obvious ones and then there's the ones that are not so obvious. And it's really important to go over all of these with the patient. The number one symptom is pain. 70% of patients that have symptoms or end up getting an MRI uh, to see what's going on it's, it is headaches. And, and the great majority of is headaches. And it's probably higher than 35%. This is just a, a meta-analysis from a bunch of studies. Um, so I would say it's probably, you know, uh, uh, 40 to 45 percent. Um, neck pain, girdle pain, and, and limb pain, uh, arm and leg in that order. And, but overall, pain is 70 percent of the, the presenting symptoms. But also along with those that are non-pain related, and the ones that are more, um, as a neurosurgeon, these are the ones that are not that pain's not important for us, but weakness tells us that there's some um, deficits within the uh, neurologic tissue and the nerves. And that's um, something that usually progresses. And that's usually a bell that goes off that says we need um, you know, to address the Chiari. And weakness is the big one. And the great majority of patients um, will have some form of weakness that, that sometimes isn't obvious and even the patient doesn't know, but on physical exam, you'll be able to see, particularly in the hands. Um, hand intrinsic weakness is usually the first one. And I'll always ask patients about, um, you know, if they drop their coffee mug, if they're having problems, um, you know, when they're picking things up, used to say keys all the time, but people don't use keys that much anymore. So, um, you know, lifting a, a coffee mug um, or any type of mug or glass and, and feeling like that you're losing your grip is, is a good indicator. Numbness is another one um, in the arms, um, in around the neck region, around the shoulders, uh, but usually in the arms, one or both. Um, and then particularly patients with uh, syrinx, which we'll talk a little bit about, will have loss of temperature sensation. Um, unsteady gait, double vision, Difficulty swallowing, which is a big one that often gets missed. People don't think about it and you really have to ask. And then tinnitus or ringing in the ear, feeling pressure in the ear. That's, I think, much higher than 7%. And I would say that probably up to 30, 40% of the patients when asked um, will, will talk about ringing in the ear. And then other things, uh, uh, dizziness, fainting, facial numbness, hiccups, um, sweating, uncontrollable sweating. Um, and then the signs, these are things that, that we see. They're not symptoms that as a patient you feel, but things that others see. Uh, nystagmus is a big one. Uh, when the eyes have this very quick beating, it can be upbeat, um, it can be lateral nystagmus. And that's why the doctor will always look for that. Difficulty with gait, um, it can just be balance. It can be problems more often than not turning um, when you're walking and you have to negotiate a turn. There's kind of a little bit of an unsteadiness. People sometimes grab a wall. Um, clumsy, frequent falls, bumping into walls. Another one is, is people kind of hitting their foot on a stair when they go up and down. Um, and again, a lot of people don't think much of this until you start putting it together. And as I mentioned, hands are one of the first things that we usually see, and you'll see hand atrophy, particularly in the thenar eminence, which is in, in your thumb and forefinger there, you'll see that muscle will start to get sunken down on one or both sides. And then weakness, especially in the arms, most common. Um, and then the sensory loss that is a classic cape-like distribution. It's not as common as you think, um, and it is more with a syrinx. Um, and then fasciculations, and that's where we see these kind of little um, spasms, uh, particularly in the hands, the legs, uh, you'll see muscle spasms. Fatigue, depression, and memory loss. These are things that are real. Um, and what we you know, used to say all the time is that Chiari doesn't cause memory loss. But there's a lot of new research that's showing that um, some of the cerebellum, the area in the back of the brain that's affected, um, we never used to think traditionally that memory was stored there. But there are some pathways that are responsible um, for the pathways in memory. We are actually just started a study with our neuropsychological team here to start looking at patients pre that, are, that do have memory loss as a symptom 
pre and post surgery to see if there's a correlation with the Chiari being treated and if their memory gets better. But all of these symptoms, they're definitely real, but they're a constellation of signs and symptoms. You know, when you're in pain all the time, particularly you're having chronic headaches, you're going to feel fatigue all the time. It sucks the life out of you. And then you, in turn, you become depressed. It affects your family life. It affects your work. It affects how you carry yourself in your day-to-day -day activities. Um, misdiagnosis and poor communication worsen. Um, you know, going to a doctor and having them tell you it's all in your head or it's stress, um, you know, it's really important to communicate things and communicate them properly. Um, and that gets done by education and understanding. And by doing that, you reduce and you relieve a lot of these symptoms. And I see it all the time in my office. Um, you know, the devil's in the details. There's over a hundred different types of headaches, all with varying symptoms. Um, and it, it, I would tell you, and if you talk to the headache specialists, it's over a hundred. So again, not everyone that has a Chiari and has headaches, the headaches are re related to the Chiari. And why is that important? It's important because you don't want to be doing brain surgery on somebody. And you certainly don't want to be a patient getting brain surgery um, with the wrong diagnosis. Because if you have a true migraine, you're going to undergo Chiari decompression. It's not going to help your migraines. And in some cases, it can make it worse. Um, pain is very common, but it almost always fits a pattern. So when I see someone in my office, I want to see a pattern. This, you know, patients who have fibromyalgia and other types of pain symptoms where it's really diffuse and it's everywhere and the skin um, is painful to touch um, and there's burning sensations. If it's not in a pattern, it's usually not directly correlated to the Chiari. Weakness, same thing, it's very specific. It's, it's generally not a generalized weakness. It's hand weakness, leg weakness, legs giving out, um, uh, uh, hands, arms, things like that. Particularly patients that are having their arms up a lot, I see it in air dressers where it'll just give out. Um, and if symptoms, if the symptoms don't correlate with the Chiari, it's the degree of a good uh, uh, outcome from the surgery is unlikely. And, and I see patients all the time in my office that have had surgery um, and they're just not better. And you, know, you go back and you look at what their original symptoms were um, and it just, the, the surgery wasn't, um, I don't wanna say it wasn't indicated, but they went down a slippery slope and the symptoms didn't really correlate with the Chiari. And that's where you get into this really dangerous slope of undergoing three, four, five, six surgeries for the same thing. You know, if the first surgery doesn't help, um, the diagnosis is usually wrong and continued surgeries is usually gonna make things worse and cause new problems. And what I mean by that is sometimes patients do need reoperations after a Chiari, but almost always they'll feel relief of their symptoms right after the first Chiari surgery. And it usually lasts more than you know, a few days or weeks. It's usually months, a year, two years. Then the symptoms will slowly come back. And that's the whole host of other recurrences, reherniation, um, uh, uh, scar tissue, things like that. Um, so facts and thoughts um, and, and keeping these in mind, and these are facts, 30% of patients who have Chiari don't have any symptoms. So again, it gets back to the, you know, you don't have a definite sentence of needing surgery and, you know, um, being in pain for the rest of your life uh, by being diagnosed with a Chiari. Um, if you do have a Chiari and your symptoms are related, the results are excellent but many patients have Chiari and are completely in, in, uh, uh, asymptomatic. And again, this is one that I always say with a ca caveat, no one dies of a Chiari. And the reason I say that is what it, tell, it should tell patients and, and really the doctors, you don't have to rush into something. This isn't like somebody coming into your office with a brain tumor or some other um, life-threatening disease that's gonna continue to get worse every day and have you know, a fatal outcome. Um, you can, you know, most patients have Chiari's for very long times and are symptomatic and, and often miss, you know, not often, but sometimes misdiagnosed. So the point is, is that you have time to evaluate and try conservative measures before you jump right into surgery. Um, because surgery, it's not a trial. When you try a medication, when you try physical therapy, that's a trial. You're seeing if it works. If it doesn't work, there's no harm done. Um, you can stop a medication, even if you get side effects if, or if it doesn't work. Same thing with physical therapy, same things with all the other different therapies. Surgery, that's it. Once that scalpel hits your skin, it's permanent. Um, and again, you have to choose the treatment for the condition, not the symptom. You don't do Chiari surgery for headaches or pain. You choose Chiari surgery 
for the condition that's related to the symptom. Um, and that's a really important point. Um, and the other thing that I wanna hammer home, and these are all things that I just wanna get into before we, we talk about why we decide, these are the thought processes that go through deciding who needs conservative therapy and medical management and who needs surgery. Um, the degree of her herniation, I, I can tell you, and most uh, carry surgeons will tell you, we don't really go by that. Um, you know, some people are, I'm 15, you're 20, you're five, you're six. Um, I can tell you I have patients with six, seven millimeters of descent who are really symptomatic from the Chiaris and have excellent results with surgeries. And I have some patients, I'll show you one, uh, who have, you know, 20 millimeters of descent, um, but their CSF that's able to get around and they're really not that symptomatic. So really operating on just the, the, the millimeters of herniation is really not the right way to go. So the initial visit is key. Who to, the, the, the number one thing is who to offer surgery to. That's really the most important and um, really um, uh, uh, critically um, uh, uh, important for the patient uh, 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 because it affects their life. So that's really the number one goal. And who to follow, you know, not just say, well, it's not your care, there's nothing I can do, but who to follow who to get with the right specialist, or who to say, look, you do have a Chiari, and you know what, you may be symptomatic in a number of years, um, so we have to follow this. And it's not so much, my practice is not MRIs, but it's more clinical symptoms. I follow my patients every year, regardless, um, if they have a Chiari, and they'll come in and we'll talk about if there's new symptoms or not, I'll do a physical exam, and if there are, great. Um, if, if there is something new, then we'll usually get an MRI. Um, and who to help. And that's a key thing. Um, you know, as before we're surgeons, we're doctors, and that's our number one, you know, role. And to be a doctor, that means you're helping patients. And, you know, you have to get them with the right people, even if it's not in your, your same specialty, and you have to be their advocate. Um, you know, patient selection is key. So, you know, who you select is, you know, you're, you're going to be a great surgeon with great outcomes if you select the right patients, um, and your patients are going to be happy. And with that, it takes a team, you know, to do the things I just mentioned, you have to have a team. And we put our own team together because it's very different of me picking up the phone and calling my cognitive neurologist and saying, you know what, I have a patient who's a really nice person. Um, they've got a Chiari and they're having really severe memory issues. I don't think it's that I need you to see them as opposed to here's a script, go find a cognitive neurologist. And many of you out there know that to see a neurologist, um, you know, it can take six months in some cities to get somebody. And that's even, you know, uh, 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 if you can get somebody good. So some thoughts in that um, are, um, sorry, uh, I'm sorry, I'm on call here. So I'm just uh, answering something here. Um, so these are thoughts, but they're my thoughts. Um, and I think, you know, most people that do this a lot and do this as a specialty would agree. You cannot compare adult and pediatric Chiari. Um, they're not the same. And pediatric neurosurgeons will remind you every day um, that, you know, adults aren't, uh, a, uh, I'm sorry, children aren't just little adults. Um, it's a different disease. It's a different pathophysiology. And, and the surgical um, uh, techniques and uh, thoughts are also very different. Um, so it's really important. You, you, one is not the same. You know, adults and pediatrics, are, they're two totally different things. Um, Age is not a limitation. The oldest person I operated on was an 87 year old. Um, and she was probably for a good 10 years suffering from Chiari and was in a wheelchair when I saw her. And the reason I agreed to operate on her, she's, first of all, she was very healthy. She could not walk. This poor woman went within you know, six months time of being fairly independent, went from a cane to a walker to a wheelchair um, and had a really significant Chiari. And she did wonderfully. Um, so age is not a uh, limitation, um, again, if the diagnosis is correct. Every case is unique. You really have to do everything that I just talked about to make sure that um, you know, uh, you're putting all those things into the thought process. Um, you know, again, 1% of all MRIs will show an incidental Chiari. That's 3 million uh, 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 people out there. So again, you have to put the case and the patient and the symptoms and the imaging all together. Um, so let's, let's go into some patients. So this is a, 
a young woman, 25 years old, um, who I saw in the office. She was referred um, by her neurologist. Um, and actually, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, not her neurologist. It was actually her, her primary care doctor. Very good primary care doctor, 25 years of experience. Um, and basically told her, look, you have a Chiari. All this fits. Uh, you know, he sent her for an MRI. And you know, she had horrible neck pain. Um, she just felt fatigued all the time. Um, and she had debilitating headaches. And this was a really high functioning um, uh, uh, woman who basically almost lost her job because she was just missing out, losing out on uh, uh, all of her sick days. Um, she just couldn't get to work uh, in the morning and she got an MRI and this is what it showed. And she does in fact have a Chiari. Uh, there's no question about it. Um, it's, it's, you know, I would say about six millimeters of descent and the radiologist correctly read this as, as an MRI. And she was packaged for surgery. I mean, it wasn't a question to talk about surgery, you know, talk about whether you need surgery or not or a diagnosis. It was, you need surgery. So when I saw this and I, I examined her and I saw her um, physical exam, you know, I, and talked to her, you know, she's an extremely high stress job. She basically wasn't sleeping at all. She was getting about two hours of sleep for the past six months. Um, her neck, when you pushed on it was tender, uh, which is a number one sign. Chiari doesn't cause that type of pain when you push on muscle. That's muscle pain, that's muscle fatigue, which is very different. Um, and she had a history as well as her mother of childhood migraines, light sensitivity, loud noises. Um, and on her exam, most importantly, um, she was completely normal. Um, normal, healthy 25 year old. She had a little bit of hyperreflexia, but that's normal in a 25 year old female. So what I did was I got her with my headache specialist. They treated her for her headaches um, and they were resolved. I mean, completely went away. She didn't care about anything else. That was her number one problem. She changed her sleep habits and she got a new pillow, um, which helped with her neck. And I mean, I was her greatest hero. Um, I, I mean, she was more grateful than patients that I do big surgeries on, um, including ruptured aneurysms and things like that, because you know we saved her from surgery. And at the end of the day, it was putting all these things together um, to, you know, to treat that as opposed to uh, giving, offering her surgery, even though it sounded like that. And her primary care doctor, you know, really uh, a center for that referral. And getting back to our previous discussion, I mean, you know, that was a true Chiari. It was, it was small, six millimeters, but variation in measurements. You also have to keep that in mind. Um, these are two different levels of herniation that are read um, as uh, 12 and 7 based on sitting and lying down. Um, so you get variations on the MRI based on your blood pressure. There's a lot of different variables and, and you can get two patients and it'll change a little bit all the time. So, you know, imaging in of itself um, has its limitations. And one of the things, this is a live video of, these are the one of the things that I use extensively. What you're seeing here, this white pulsatile is cerebral spinal fluid. And what this is, is a Cine flow study. And it's critically helpful because if this flow, this CSF is flowing around the cerebellum and in front of the brainstem, the goal of surgery is to remove this area of bone and open this area up so that this flow gets reestablished. That's the whole physiology of Chiari. I'm not helping anybody by doing this surgery here and decompressing this if this flow is intact. And this is a really helpful tool um, to help us uh, 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 determine um, with patients that, that have a borderline Chiari if the Chiari is um, part of the, the symptoms. So let's go to HD. It's a 42 year old female who has mild headaches, really weren't her major concern. Those are like, yeah, you know, I'll take a Tylenol, it's fine. It's, it's nothing that bothers me. Um, but she did notice she was dropping objects and really what brought her in was her neck pain. And she was pretty certain as well as her neurologist who she saw that she was gonna have herniated discs. And you know she felt unsteady on her feet. So an MRI was done of her cervical spine. And you can see this is, this is a massive Chiari here. Um, and this Chiari is, again, it's not so much the descent, but what you see, and this is after I did surgery and decompressed her. Look at, this is the brainstem here. And this is the cerebellum. Look at how this, as this is being pulled down, it's literally pulling the entire brain and brainstem down into the spinal canal. And by releasing this, everything, it's almost like cutting a rubber band. Everything kind of springs back up. And now you don't see, look at this to this. 
it's way back up there. But more importantly, look at the white. You're seeing the cerebral spinal fluid that's now freely flowing. So on, on that office visit, she had ringing in her ears, difficulty swallowing, headaches, which were worse when lifting, all things that were really never brought out until somebody asked her and talked to her. She had hand intrinsic weakness, decreased gag reflex, um, ataxia, trunkal ataxia. I mean, she was literally wobbly just standing, um, which we call titivation or trunkal ataxia. Every day of the week, that patient needs surgery. That's going to progress to a point of being incapacitated. And that, those are the cases where if you wait too long, the outcomes are not as good. Um, so you can see again, where she had all of those symptoms was the pulling down of her brainstem. When you see these severe cases of problems walking, hand weakness, difficulty swallowing, those cranial nerves are all right in here. The 11th, the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th cranial nerves all in here and they get pulled and stretched. Um, so, you, you know, you go from that to that, which is a big difference. So let's talk a little bit, and I'm going to stay within the time. I know I have 45 minutes, and I'm going to keep my talk to hopefully 25 to 30 minutes so I have time for all your questions. Um, so the associated symptoms that you always have to be on the lookout, and these also affect who you make a decision of who needs medical management and surgical management. Hydrocephalus is a big one. You always, always, you can't make a decision to do Chiari surgery just on a C-spine you have to do a dedicated imaging of the brain to see if there's hydrocephalus. And I will tell every one of my patients before surgery, up to 10% and up to 15% in young women, the underlying condition is hydrocephalus. The hydrocephalus and the increased fluid and pressure here in the brain will push down and cause the Chiari. Um, the hernia herniated cerebellum is, is, is the hallmark of Chiari and then syrinx, which is the other third most common. Um, so for hydrocephalus, again, you have to rule that out. And if there's hydrocephalus and a Chiari, you treat the hydrocephalus first, because if you treat the Chiari first, you're going to decompress that. They're going to keep opening up the patch where, where the dura opens up, and it's going to keep pushing down over time. So you really need to re, uh, um, reduce the pressure from above with a shunt. Um, and also the way you find out that there's hydrocephalus, if it's not obvious on the MRI, which more times than not, it's not. If I have a patient that has a leak twice, by definition, they have a hydrocephalus. Just last week, I did a case and a very lovely young woman, um, and she, would, she told me, she said, you know, I felt incredible after the surgery, and then I started feeling this pressure in my head, ringing in my ears, and then I felt this pop, and she literally leaked her incision. She was, as soon as I felt the pop, all my symptoms went away. So she was basically decompressing through the back. So she needed a shunt. There's no point in me putting a lumbar drain in her and continuing to take her to the operating room to repair a patch. Um, that's a shunt. And, and that shunt will take care of a leak as well. So our treatment for surgery is really, you know, we, we remove bone. Um, you know, the way I was taught back in the dark ages was you, you, you do these huge decompressions. And I will tell you that this is a small decompression um, within the last 18 months, um, we started doing um, half this. I remove a tiny little bit here and I make a linear incision in the dura um, and we don't open it widely. And sometimes I don't even have to put a patch in because for me, and again, this is a, a decision, a discussion for that we have in debates in our national meetings at the ASAP means every year is whether or not to, to shrink the tonsils. And this is that you can see this is a, uh, the normal exposure and these are the cerebellar tonsils here. And you can see this is what's hanging down. Now, if I just sew this back, I'm making this area tight again and these tonsils are stuck down there by shrinking them, not cutting them out, not dissecting them, but just shrinking them. by putting a little heat on here with cautery, they shrivel up, shrivel up. And this area of the brain doesn't do anything. There's no, um, uh, there's no pathways or fibers in here that do anything. Now this area is wide open all the time. Um, but the incision now is linear instead of this big V shape um, and patients recover quicker, better. And the CSF leak uh, incidence has gone essentially to zero. So I wanna talk a little bit about syrinx. Um, this is something that is um, commonly associated with, with Chiari, but not always. Um, most surgeons, if they're, this is the Chiari and this is the syrinx. Why do we get a syrinx with a Chiari? Because 
when the pressure is blocked here, uh, when the fluid's blocked here, there's a pressure buildup in the brain and in the cerebral spinal fluid. So the fluid down here can't circulate and equilibrate. So it goes within the spinal cord and it causes this cyst because it can't decompress above. And this, the headache, the pressure from coughing, laughing, sneezing is because there's a pressure gradient here. And when you do that, when the pressure increases, the fluid can't come down here and it gets blocked up here. So a syrinx with a Chiari is almost always an indication for surgery. Um, but there are exceptions. Now here's a patient every year I have to change the 15 years. This is a patient of mine who's 15 years ago came to me with essentially the same film. She has a Chiari and she has a syrinx. It's small. And she absolutely did not want surgery. Um, she, you know, refused it to the point where I was, um, which I normally do not try to talk anybody into surgery. Um, and I was really concerned about her because you're going to be, um, uh, uh, you know, you're going to be affected by this. Um, and, and she wasn't, you know, she, she's not 25 years old and, you know, she's not old, but um, she absolutely didn't want surgery. I'm following her now yearly every 15 years and nothing's changed. And her symptoms are really mild. And so why is that? Well, let's go back to the original um, discussion of why you get these symptoms. She's intermittently blocking here. You see the white? She's got CSF that's going around. And as we get older, our brain shrinks. And the more this area shrinks, the more open it becomes. And I think that's why she's not symptomatic. Um, she's got baseline tingling in her feet. Um, and again, her plan's a yearly MRI. So not everybody with a syrinx needs surgery. Now you got, here's another patient, 56 years old, who had major trauma from a motor vehicle accident 29 years prior, horrible burning pain, band around the chest, no other symptoms. And for those of you out there who have a syrinx, you know how horrible these symptoms are. No medication works. We try stimulators. We try all these different things. It's a really difficult neurogenic type pain. Um, but you have to keep in mind you know, what the surgical treatments are. So here's, this is a young guy who's in a horrible MBA and look where his syrinx is. It's in his mid thoracic region and he does not have a Chiari. So almost, you know, I wouldn't say all, but the majority of Chiari syrinxes are up in the cervical cord, right in that area of high pressure. You can get skip lesions where there's one in the syrinx and then one in the mid level of the, the uh, um, uh, uh, T-spine. And sometimes they can be isolated down here. Um, but when it's just in the T-spine after an MVA, this happened during the trauma where the cord was pulled, and this is, is what ended up happening. There's no surgery and no decompression that can help this. You can put shunts in here. It, 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 it doesn't end up um, treating it, and they almost always come back. So 70% of, of these syrinxes are associated with a Chiari, but you have to rule out a cystic tumor. Um, about 10% of the times, you're going to have some form of a tumor that presents like a um, syrinx, because it'll make this fluid. So you always have to get an MRI uh, with contrast. Trauma is, is probably the other 20%. When somebody has a trauma and a syrinx, I'm always thinking it's a trauma first. Um, and then basal invagination, which is just another symptom where the, ba the base of the skull just falls into the top of the uh, uh, spine. Um, and you see this, um, and you, you can see I mean, that where these can get really quite large. Um, symptoms are almost always pain, sensory loss with what we call dissociation, um, where you lose pain and temperature uh, a sensation when you're touched, weakness, especially in the upper extremities, arms and hands. Um, and then if this is where you hear that classic cape-like distribution of uh, numbness um, in, in the upper arms. And that's usually where it's a perfectly symmetric syrinx in the upper um, uh, 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 C-spine area. So advice, you are your only proponent. And that goes with anything healthcare related. If something doesn't seem right, feel right, you're not getting the answers, don't stop being a pain in the butt. Um, that, that's what you should be doing because you really are your only proponent. Speak up, make your doctor explain everything to you. If they're not explaining it to you, um, you need to make them explain it to you. And, and if your doctor, gets frustrated with that or gets short with you, then you need to find another doctor because that's our job is to make sure you explain everything. I'm a, I, I, I'm a fast talker. So I'll, I've made it a point uh, over the years to basically at the end say, do, does that make sense? Did I, does everything, did I explain everything to you? Do you have questions? You have to be able to speak up if there's something you're not sure about. And don't be afraid to get a second opinion. I tell every one of my patients, 
You're not going to offend me if you get a second opinion. There's no problem in getting a second opinion. The problem that I warn people with, and including my own family members and friends that call and ask, if you get th three and four and five opinions, you're going to get confused. Then everybody's going to be doing this. Um, a second opinion is a good thing. And if there's a split where the, there's one opinion and a second opinion, and they're completely different, that's where a third opinion is important. But usually you, you'll almost always, you'll hear at least within the realm, something similar. Um, and the internet's not a bad thing. I know a lot of patients are like, oh, you're going to be mad at me. I went on the internet. I think it's great because there's a lot of really great things. You just have to keep in mind that what the source is, and you have to keep in mind that, you know, for this last 25 minute talk, um, there's a lot of details that go along. So you can't take everything into a vacuum from the internet. So symptom, my treatment paradigm is symptoms first, MRI second. Um, I don't, that means that I'm concerned about the symptoms and then I'm, I'm concerned about what the MRI looks like. Um, early symptoms my, that are mild, I'll follow closely. Um, and again, you're not going to die if you wait six months, a year to really ensure that the diagnosis is right. Um, and you're not going to wake up paralyzed. I tell this is one of my classic sayings, you know, patients are diagnosed with this. I tell them you probably had this either since birth or for a really long time. And think of all the things you've done, childbirth, lifting, um, you know, falling off of things, your, your whole life, the things you've done, you're, you're not going to wake up paralyzed from this. And if there's no symptoms, um, or science, there's no surgery. And that's almost a given. It's extreme. Uh, there's very few circumstances where an incidentally found Chiari with absolutely no signs or symptoms needs or requires surgery. Doesn't mean you don't need to follow it, but it also means you most likely don't need surgery. Um, and any motor weakness, balance issues, or brainstem findings, that's where, where surgery really becomes more recommended. So in conclusion, um, symptoms of Chiari are multifactorial. Um, MRI findings do not always correlate with the clinical symptoms. You can have a small degree of herniation and be really clinically symptomatic and vice versa. Um, Chiari is treatable and curable, but right patient choice is absolutely essential. And again, I can't emphasize this enough. Be vocal and be your strongest advocate. Thank you. I went a little bit over, but I will uh, answer any questions that are out there. And let me just get to my screen here so I can see. I'll read them to you. Okay, great. Okay. My daughter was diagnosed with Chiari at two and is now 11. At diagnosis, she had a syrinx all the way to her lumbar area. It is currently down through her thoracic area. She has had more frequent monitoring lately because it's wider in the C-spine. It has been stable at six and seven millimeters respectively. Do you still look at symptoms if she should continue to get wider? Right now, she is basically asymptomatic, mild headache from time to time. She has two decompression surgeries, the bone regroup. Okay, um, and she, I'm sorry, how old was she? She was, uh, she was diagnosed at two and is now 11. Okay, um, yeah, I mean, I, that's a really good question. This is a discussion I have with my pediatric colleagues all the time when we talk about not opening the dura, not, oh, they do great without shrinking the tonsils. And I'm like, well, I see all these people and they're adults. So um, uh, particularly in children, um, you can re-herniate. And if the syrinx, first of all, if she's asymptomatic, that's wonderful. Um, and again, for my talk, um, you know, I think she's already had two decompressions. Um, I, 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 I don't know that what another one's going to do. Um, I, you know, it's, it's hard to say without films, but what I would strongly recommend is talk to our neurosurgeon and um, ask for an MRI sine flow. I think those are very, very helpful, um, particularly if they didn't shrink the tonsils. If there's blockage of flow, then that tells you that there, there, there needs to be more of a decompression, but it's not the bony decompression. You need to decompress that tissue. If there's adequate CSF flow through that and she's asymptomatic, I would continue to watch. Someone asked a question, should everyone have a CINE MRI study? Um, that's a really good question. And, and I don't think so. And, and um, you know, early on I used to, and then I started to realize that, I mean, if somebody is symptomatic, they have the right symptoms, they have a clear Chiari, uh, a Chiari um, it's not gonna change what I do. Where Chiari, the CINE flow is really helpful are in patients that have a Chiari and the symptoms, it's, it's kind of hard to correlate whether the symptoms are related or not. 
that's where it really helps me to become um, the decision maker. Um, and it also helps me after when I, when I see patients, um, uh, uh, either mine or in second opinion that are re having new symptoms um, after a decompression, I'll always get a Cine flow. But if you have a Chiar, if you have, I'm sorry, I keep saying Chiar, if you have a, you know, a, a clear um, obstruction of CSF flow from the, the cerebellar tonsils and you're symptomatic and the symptoms fit, it's not going to change much. I have a coworker with Chiari and he's absolutely afraid to come meet you. What can I say to make him feel better? <laughs> Tell him that you talk to me and that I don't, I don't have horns and, and, and sharp teeth. Um, you know, I get it. People, um, you know, the, the, the fear of, of and, and, you know, especially if you get online, let me tell you something. If I was not in healthcare and I, was, I didn't do what I did for a living and I got on the internet and somebody told me I had Chiari, I probably wouldn't want to see a doctor because of all the, some of the scary stuff that's out there. Um, but I, I, I'm happy to see anybody. What I would say is it doesn't hurt to talk. Um, you know, they're in control of their decision process and what you'll get out of that. It doesn't matter if it's me or any neurosurgeon to talk to a neurosurgeon because they can educate them. And at the end of the day, he doesn't have to do anything he doesn't want to do. Um, and sometimes a really safe way now during COVID, what we learned is telemedicine has brought in a lot of people out who normally would just not take the initiative out of fear or whatever else to go to a doctor's office to just do a telemedicine visit. Back in the Stone Age, 12 years ago, what kind of patches were used? Um, so 12 years ago, uh, everything from bovine pericardium um, to synthetic, a lot of the companies made um, patches that were um, uh, synthetic and made out of like a Gore-Tex or a Gore-Tex variant. Um, some of the old time surgeons, um, and I shouldn't say old time, I mean, um, some surgeons will use the patient's own fascia. Um, so they'll just make a bigger incision and take some of the, the uh, layer um, just under the fat and it's um, their own tissue, which is fine as well. Um, so there are a lot of different things. Um, some, what never works though, is some people will not put a patch in and open the dura and they'll try to leave this really thin arachnoid layer intact. I've never seen that work. Even when you're closing and you don't see any CSF, I mean, it's literally like trans, translucent. It's so thin and it almost always pops at some point and causes a, a big fluid collection. Have you ever removed the tonsils? I always, I mean, my practice, I've been doing this for 20 years. My practice over the last over decade has been to shrink the tonsils. I never quote unquote, remove the tonsils. And if you talk to people who are uh, against it and they talk about it causes scar tissue, it causes, there are people that will literally remove them and they'll surgically remove them. Um, and it's a bloody mess um, and all that blood escapes and it causes an inflammatory response. Um, and it's, it's, it's a much longer surgery. Um, it's, uh, I, I think, a more morbid surgery. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to make, I, and I don't, I, to be honest with you, for as many Chiari surgeries as I've done, I, this is a video I have to make for ASAP particularly. Um, and I have a couple of surgeries this week. Is all, I mean, if you saw what this is, it's taking, they look like forceps and they generate heat. And every surgery, every surgeon uses them from abdominal surgery to brain surgery. They're called bipolars. And you literally just touch the tissue and you turn the heat on and it just shrivels up. There's no blood, there's no scar tissue. It just shrinks them. And it shrinks them depending on how much you need to shrink them. So I almost always do. Um, and I, I, the, most of the patients that I have to reoperate on are patients that have been done somewhere else where the, the cerebellar tonsils have not been shrunk. And a lot of them were done in childhood at pediatric institutions, and then they become adults, and then it re -herniates. If there are no patterns in the symptoms, is it certain that they are not from Chiari? No. And, and you know, that's, that's the tough thing and the challenging thing. And I think that the rewarding thing about um, this and the art of it, of, of medicine in particular, is that there's never, you're never certain of anything. Um, and the reason that I was so strong about making sure that's because, you know, the worst thing that any surgeon feels uh, is operating on someone and saying, this wasn't the right surgery, um, particularly when you're dealing with the brain. So, you, you know, sometimes symptoms are, um, I've been fooled. Um, and I've had patients that 
Um, you know, the symptoms, they do have a Chiari, um, but the symptoms just don't really, um, they kind of fit, but not really. Um, but the things I was talking about were, I mean, if you're, if you're just fatigued all the time and you have pain, but it's pain that's everywhere in your body and you feel weak, literally weak all the time, you, there's something else going on. That's a systemic problem. That's not focal within the brain. So that's where Cine flow comes in. That's where Cine flow is really helpful. If there's no blockage of flow and the symptoms don't fit a pattern, it's unlikely that the surgery is going to help. Now, it doesn't mean the symptoms aren't real. And it doesn't mean that we, we can't help you in another way. We just have to figure out the right diagnosis. What causes low back pain with Chiari and syringomyelia? Um, so it's it, the, the uh, syringomyelia can cause low back pain because it's just a, the whole spinal cord kind of gets, uh, gets stretched out and those, those pain fibers get stretched as well. Those are the ones that are right in the, the center of the cord and they get stretched and pulled. Um, and it's, you know, people call it pain, but it, and sometimes it is actual pain, but a lot of times it's fatigue and it's muscle fatigue, which is painful. Um, because your, your legs, the, 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 the motor innervation just gives out. As an SM patient with severe symptoms and been told that Chiari five millimeters wasn't severe enough, what would you recommend? Again, a Cine flow. Um, if the five millimeters doesn't matter, if you have a syrinx and it's surge, it's cervical, especially, it doesn't mean it can't be thoracic, but especially if it's cervical, and it's, it's, you know, five millimeters of descent and there's um, some intermittent, you know, there's CSFs, even slow flow, um, then it most likely is from that. Would you consider 2.5 centimeter displacement significant enough to operate on accompanying symptoms? I am a 24 year old and I was diagnosed incidentally when I was 14. I have extremely unsteady balance, gait, dizziness, blood vision, black spots, floaters, and frequent headaches. Yeah. Uh, 2.5 centimeters or millimeters? CM. Yeah, I mean, if it's centimeters, that's 25 millimeters, and that's pretty significant. Um, and it would be hard pressed to say that that's not causing most, if not all, of your symptoms. Um, now, if it's 2.5 millimeters, what's that? The person just wrote in the bottom centimeters. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not really sure why they would be saying that that's not related. It, uh, and that's a, that's a pretty significant Chiari. I did that one. Why are headaches worse in the morning when you wake up? Because when we sleep and when we're flat, the intracranial pressure is elevated. So when we sleep, our um, CO2 goes up because we're not breathing as much. And when CO2 goes up, the veins, the big sinuses in the back of the head engorge, um, and you're lying flat. When you lie flat, your ICP goes up as well, normally. Um, so both of those things will contribute, particularly with patients that have a Chiari or any other type of you know, hydrocephalus or anything else that's causing pressure in the head. It's, it's uh, very common. And patients that have sleep apnea, that's also why it's a really common uh, a symptom is waking up with severe headaches. Can you talk about scar tissue? Yeah, and I'm assuming this is in, in um, relation to Chiari and, and to decompression. Um, and again, these are my thoughts uh, as, as from my experience. So by no, no means am I, do I have all the answers and am I right on everything? I can only speak to my experience. I'm not a big believer in scar tissue. I think that what I, what I have seen is where some people, um, the brain, the, the cerebellar tonsils, um, you know, because you never remove them entirely and the cerebellum can stick um, to the uh, surgical site, can stick to where the patch is, it can stick to um, you know, the dura, and it just gets really adherent there. And then it, again, it blocks the flow. But this idea of scar tissue, where there's this like webs and scar tissue like you get in the abdomen, which is very common after GI surgery, it's just not that common. And that's, again, another really great role for a cine flow. Because if there's scar tissue that is um, obstructing flow or causing significant obstruction there, um, then you're gonna see it on the cine flow. It's gonna be blocking the flow as well. Um, and I think, unfortunately, this is where you see a lot of people, and I think some surgeons, especially younger ones, get 
you know, hooked into this where, oh, there's scar tissue. I'm going to go in and, and break down the scar tissue. There's, you know, if you talk to any patient that's had that redo for scar tissue, some of them get better soon. I mean, uh, right after the surgery, almost all of them, it recurs. And that's where you start seeing like, you know, every two years I'm getting surgery for scar tissue. It's not the scar tissue. With the, with the Chiari, uh, yes, with Chiari diagnosis and associated symptoms, is it possible that the cause of the symptoms is from an unknown small CSF leak, possibly from an epidural during childbirth? Yes, um, you can absolutely see that. And it, it, it's something that needs to be ruled out. Um, it, it can be from that and it can be really difficult to detect. Um, and it can be spontaneous sometimes. People that have never had a, a lumbar puncture, an epidural, or anything. But if you have had a lumbar puncture, an epidural, um, and you have a Chiari, and you have new symptoms that are, you never had before, um, that has to be ruled out. And usually, a good degree uh, uh, um, of certainty, you can rule that out with at least a trial of a blood patch, where they inject blood in that area, and it will cause a little bit of a scar to seal it up. Why do symptoms worsen during my periods? Um, well, it depends what you mean by symptoms, but uh, headaches, it's very common. Um, and that's, you know, most patients with severe migraines will tell you during their period, um, that's kind of a, a, a time that will, um, uh, you know, cause an issue. And there's a lot of other things. There's other growth factors and things like that. Um, certain brain, like meningiomas, which are benign brain tumors, they have estrogen receptors on them. They can grow. Uh, um, and those symptoms become worse during um, uh, periods. So I think um, it, there, there's, def there's a hormonal relationship with uh, uh, the fluctuations of the estrogen and progesterone that can cause headaches. Are there any other surgeries beside decompressions? Um, you know, it's another really good question. It's something that I kind of really, I've been working with a lot of my colleagues in industry to see you know, it's always bothered me um, that it's such a big surgery. And it's, and if you think about what we're doing to treat this problem, um, you know, we're removing half the skull, removing some of the lamina of the spinal uh, uh, um, vertebral column, opening up the dura, putting a patch in, shrinking tonsils. Um, and I, part of the problem is, is that not everybody agrees on what the cause is. And I think it's been pretty well mapped out um, at Oldfield who worked at NIH for a long time, was one of the first people to really describe what the pathophysiology was. And I think if there's a way to divert fluid there, um, and it's something that um, we're working on, let's put it that way. And, and, and one of the first steps was this new surgery that we're doing, which is really, it's not the point of minimally invasive. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's still surgery, but it's not going through all that. And it's trying to show that if you just open up that cerebral spinal fluid pathway, then you're taking care of the problem. And once that's proven, then the surgery can be even, you know, just percutaneously on a, um, a radiographic table, an interventional table, kind of slipping in a little tube to just keep that pathway open. So I think, I think this, my opinion is, and I hope if, if we do our job as, as doctors and surgeons, I think the Chiari surgery is gonna be a thing of the past. But right now, as of today, unfortunately, it's decompression. We're going to take three more questions that are here, and then we'll call it a night. Okay. Okay. Um, you have, let's see, for patients being followed by CM and SM, most physicians recommend yearly MRI. Would a repeat CINI be appropriate? I'm sorry, following them for what? For patients being followed for Chiari, or syringomyelia, most physicians recommend yearly MRI. Would a repeat CINI be appropriate? Um, again, it depends on the patient. Um, I like the, so first of all, for my patients, I don't get yearly MRIs. Um, it's not gonna change what I do. So if I see a patient who's got, you know, seven millimeter herniation with a Chiari, and you know, they're really doing well and their, their symptoms haven't changed or they don't have symptoms, an MRI is not going to change what I do. Um, now, if I have patients and their symptoms are now starting to get worse and I have a baseline Cine flow, then it's a good study to get. The Cine flow is a good tool to basically help determine is there correlation with obstruction and the symptoms. 
Um, so, I mean, it certainly doesn't hurt. Um, it doesn't add, you know, MRI, there's no radiation. You don't need contrast. Um, it, it doesn't hurt. Any recommendation for a neurologist or neurosurgeon um, in Jacksonville, Florida area? Um, yeah, in Jacksonville, there's um, some really good ones. Um, there, uh, uh, Ricardo uh, and now, um, you know what I can do? You want um, to send it to me? Yeah, I'll send them to you, Patrice. And then whoever that was who's asking that question, um, you can contact me at patrice underscore shoblin at asap.org. There's no name there. Okay, we have um, two left and that's it. Okay. Can you, I promise. Is there oh, anything okay. to alleviate seasonal migraines? Uh, can you do what to alleviate seasonal migraines? Anything that they can do to oh, alleviate. For seasonal migraines? They're asking you that question. I guess maybe they're worse with Chiari. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if you have a Chiari, I mean, um, you know, migraines can be exacerbated by a lot of different things and it can be seasonal. Um, uh, that, that one I would have to defer to a headache specialist. Okay, and our last question here is where can we find information on where can we find information on the use of cannabis for symptom management? Um, so as, as Patrice mentioned, um, you know, through a very generous grant, this is, you know, shows you the importance of ASAP that yes, it's education, but also, you know, working to do meaningful things to help uh, patients who suffer from Chiari. Um, we have a, a pretty big project going on um, with, um, people that uh, are really have studied medical marijuana, both at a basic science level, as well, well as uh, people who have, um, have experience with medical marijuana and managing it. Um, we're doing a study now. Um, so one of the places that you can look at is um, the Siri Foundation. It's C-E-R-I, um, who's one of the um, co-sponsors of this and, and co-investigators. Um, and I mean, that would be the main one. The problem with, with this is that's where you're gonna get a plethora of just misinformation because medical marijuana and marijuana as a whole is a big business right now. So they're gonna tell you it cures everything from cancer to this, to that. And what we're trying to figure out is, you know, there's 50 different, at least 50 different strains of, of medical marijuana with different levels of CBD, THC, um, so what we're trying to figure out is what combination is most helpful for patients. Because many of my patients and most doctors' patients are on medical marijuana. Some of the folks in my uh, organization prescribe it. Uh, uh, Jill Farmer, who's our movement disorder director and treats a lot of Parkinson's patients uh, um, who have uh, uh, spasms and things like that, um, uh, uh, will prescribe it. And so we're trying to see what strains work for what problem. But uh, try a Siri Foundation, C-E-R-I. And then a per that person continued, said, do you need any participants I have been using for three years? Absolutely. Uh, if you send Patrice your contact information, um, we can um, get you into our database. Absolutely. Okay. I think that's great. Thank you. It's going right now, too. So I hope you hear me because you're frozen. Yeah, um, I want to thank I everybody. Yep. Go uh, ahead. Were, I'm sorry. Yeah, you were a little frozen there, but yeah, no, thank you so much, Patrice, as always. And, um, you know, again, uh, ASAP is an incredible organization. It's something that you, you see the caliber of, of, of doctors and researchers and healthcare providers that always, always um, make this a priority. It's an incredible organization. And, um, you know, thank you, um, uh, everybody in ASAP, uh, Patrice and, and, and Pat and everybody else. Really appreciate it.